this is a video I recommend everyone check out um, called Wokeism. So this is not some right wing Ben Shapiro, you know, feminist debunked compilation dumb crap from the Daily Wire. OK, this is uh, Hans George Muller, who is a philosopher um, who right now is working in China. I think he's originally from Germany. I don't know if he calls himself a Marxist, but it's very clear that his work is inspired by Marx. Um, and he does a lot of analysis of pro-felicity, um, people's online profiles, how their online profiles in the modern era relate to their identities, um, how that affects behavior, how that affects psychology. Um, very, very interesting stuff that Carlos has taught at SIU for some of his classes. Uh, Carefree Wandering, someone asked. Yeah, that's the name of his uh, channel, is Carefree Wandering. Dr. Hans-George Muller is his, uh, his name, though. Um, so he did this analysis uh, and criticism of what he calls wokeism and basically gives a systematic explanation and definition of what he thinks wokeism is um, and, and then argues that it's not leftist, that it's not anti-capitalist um, for various reasons. Uh, so he talks about how wokeism has been co-opted by the CIA you know, how the CIA is now advertising that they're diverse and that they're inclusive as they, you know, perpetrate coups and, and horrendous regime change efforts abroad, supporting uh, fascist governments um, in, in places like Bolivia recently with the 2019 coup um, or, or the U.S. State Department's propping up of right wing extremist elements in Ukraine. Um, plenty of examples uh, as the CIA does these woke advertisements. Um, he criticizes that, and then he criticizes basically the the corporations in the U.S. co-opting um, the LGBTQ struggle to act like they're inclusive, to act like they're not oppressing people, to act like they're not exploiting people, to act like corporations and exploitation aren't causing um, all of our problems in society. Um, and, and they're actually moving us towards a more inclusive, progressive society. Um, which of course isn't true. That doesn't, you know, get to the root of any of the problems. Uh, it doesn't do anything about the prison industrial complex, um, which exploits, uh, exploits people massively in the prisons using, uh, less than, you know, paying, paying workers less than a dollar an hour in the prisons. And you have this militarized police force, which, uh, primarily or, or disproportionately targets, uh, black and brown communities and, and impoverished communities. Um, so, you know, corporations putting a BLM sticker uh, or, or BLM flags everywhere does nothing to actually combat the militarized police force and the prison industrial complex, you know, but they're using it as, as sort of branding and marketing to act like they are moving us towards a, a better, more progressive society. Um, so in that way, Hans-George Muller argues that wokeism um, is not just, you know, social progressivism or or being left-wing or progressive on social issues as well as economic issues um, but wokeism is actually pretending to be left-wing or or socially progressive in order to distract um, or tell people that we don't need to make any changes economically uh, we don't need to worry about exploitation we don't need to worry about corporate in accumulation we don't need to worry about imperialism don't you know the cia is woke now the cia cares about lgbtq people um, so therefore, it's OK if they overthrow foreign governments and put in power fascist dictatorships who hate LGBTQ people. Um, so so that's basically how Hans George Muller defines wokeism um, and says it's basically anti-Marxist or anti-socialist. Very interesting video. One of my favorite videos of all time. Now we have this video. Which is from. Ryan Chapman, who I don't know, he seems to have a handful of subscribers here. And he's going to argue the opposite. He's going to argue that Marxism is what created wokeism. So I don't know anything or that, that wokeism finds its intellectual roots in Marxism. Basically the opposite of what our philosopher friend Carefree Wandering argued. I don't know anything about this uh, Ryan Chapman. Um, but if, if you know about him post something in the chat. Oh, thank you for the sticker frick frack. Let's go. Thank you so much for your support. Really appreciate that. Hey, what's up everyone? Today we're going to talk about some fairly uncontroversial stuff like wokeness and Karl Marx. 
It's been fashionable for a while now to compare wokeness to a religion or to a cult, in that it has orthodoxy, heretics, original sin, and all that. But that's never struck me as a critique that hits the target dead on, in that it doesn't paint that clear of a picture of what makes wokeness distinct. And the critique that does do it for me, which you probably guessed, is the critique that wokeness fundamentally comes from the ideas of Karl Marx. I'm far from the first person to make that argument. And I think most people that talk about this stuff generally struggle to not sound like conspiracy theorists. And those are usually the grounds that are used to wave away this kind of criticism. But there's actually a lot of substance behind it. And if you follow the academic trail, all roads really do point to Karl Marx. So I'm going to go through it more slowly and thoroughly than I normally do, because I think this is all criminally misunderstood. So I haven't seen all of this, but I've seen this intro part. What I imagine he's going to try and do is trace the intellectual roots back to Karl Marx using the postmodernists, using Adorno, Horkheimer, um, and other French theorists, Frankfurt School theorists, who called themselves Marxists. Now, what we argued in our recent interview with Gabriel Rockhill and what Gabriel Rockhill has argued in his work was that basically all of those um, thinkers were pseudo-Marxists. They weren't actually Marxist at all because they all dismiss existing socialism. They dismiss the USSR and China as dictatorships and, you know, dismiss the Marxists of the Eastern world um, as, as just dictator supporters and tankies. Um, and, and meanwhile, working on this more intellectual uh, ideas based uh, Marxism in the West, in the Western Academy. Um, and, and, while some of these thinkers were directly supported by the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the CIA, um, others were indirectly supported by them. Um, so the CIA, uh, Rockefeller Foundation would fund the academies, um, fund the, the higher learning institutions, and basically create the conditions um, for uh, imperialist, pseudo-Marxist academics to rise to prominence. And, and you know, there was a time where you could become a superstar intellectual, largely with funding from the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation, if you would say certain things, if you would dismiss the Soviet Union as a dictatorship and China as a dictatorship while calling yourself a socialist. Um, so even if the CIA wasn't directly influencing their opinions, they were creating the conditions for these, these sort of thinkers to exist. Um, and this is extremely, extremely useful uh, for the CIA. Controlled opposition has always been one of their, you know, one of the most um, successful tactics in thwarting left wing organization. When the ruling class, you know, funds or controls uh, people who are pretending to be in the opposition, pretending to be in the rebellion, pretending to be left wing anti-capitalist. Um and and Gabriel Rockhill argues that there's basically a global theory industry um, which produces these these kind of thinkers in the academy uh, very convincingly, I might add. So I imagine this guy over here is going to use he's going to say it started with Karl Marx. It went to Adorno and Horkheimer and the Frankfurt School in France, and then it turned into identity politics and wokeism when really. You know, you should say it started with Karl Marx. Um, China is still building Marxism, as are Cuba and many other countries, um, as was the Soviet Union back then. The U.S. created these imperialist pseudo-Marxists to try and trick people into thinking socialism has failed every time it's been tried. Um, and, and their theory sort of led to uh, anti-Marxist... Um, anti uh, wokeism or, or identity politics rather than actual anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist politics. And it needs to be understood if we're ever going to disentangle ourselves from this thing. So, yeah. So I'm going to start with going over Marxism. Not because I think you haven't heard explanations of Marxism before, but because I think explanations of it usually miss a crucial point. And that point's also crucial to understanding wokeness. And that crucial point is that Marxism is an ideology made fundamentally in opposition to liberalism. If that surprised you, then I'm glad you're watching this. Marxism at its core is a critique Correct. of liberalism and presents itself as the alternative to liberalism. And by liberalism, I don't... This guy already knows more about uh, Marx than Vouch. Vouch. Vouch said that Marxism's an extension of liberalism. So you got Vouch beat, uh, Ryan Chapman. Good job. I mean, Democrats in America right now. I mean what we now think of as the founding principles of Western civilization. I'm sorry to say we're going to have to go over liberalism too because it's crucial to understanding everything else I'm going to say. So to give a quick refresher on that, 
Liberalism is the ideology that essentially champions the freedom of the individual, if at all humanly possible. So liberals want to maximize your personal rights while putting as few restrictions on it as possible. And the place where they mostly draw the line is if you put someone else in physical harm. So you don't have the right to punch someone in the face and you don't have the right to shout fire in a crowded theater because people could panic and get hurt. But besides that, they want to maximize your individual freedoms. And that includes the freedom to think for yourself, um, speak for yourself, protest, um, have a fair trial, uh, own property, and a bunch of other stuff. So quintessential liberal text is this one, the Bill of Rights. Liberalism was made as an attempt to form an ideology that represents the interests of everyone within a society. They thought that as long as everyone had a certain amount of rights that were protected and a freedom to voice their concerns, society would over time naturally become better and better. So I guess that's what liberalism is based on, or that's what liberalism says that it's based on. Um, and I'm sure he'll go into private property at some point here, but really what liberalism is, is the protection of private property and the seizure of political power by the bourgeois class. Um, so you had this, uh, this system of feudalism that was holding back progress, right? You had kings and queens and the church hoarding land and holding onto land as the peasants starved. Um, and, and you also had this emerging class of merchants, an emerging class of manufacturers, people who own manufacturing um, facilities. So capitalists, the emerging class of capitalists, and they wanted to take political power from the church and from the feudal class, um, at least at least talking uh, in Europe. Um, and yeah, the European Enlightenment was a little bit was different uh, philosophically than the American Revolution. But, you know, these ideals of liberalism kind of work across the board. Uh, but I'm mostly focusing on the French Revolution right now um, for this example. Um, but the the bourgeois class, the emerging bourgeois class took power while organizing the peasants, telling the peasants, hey, you hate the, the landed aristocratic class too, help us overthrow them um, and the church. Um, and they did, and then they created their political system after that. So the political system was based on, you know, having a state that doesn't, uh, infer on the rights of the individual, um, and a state that keeps slavery illegal, uh, or, or feudal relations of production illegal, um, and, and allows for a contract between employer and employee basically creates the basis for a system of wage slavery. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, it says, we'll protect your political rights. You know, we'll give you absolute political freedoms. Um, but there's nothing about, you know, economic freedoms. Uh, the only economic freedom is the right to own private property. And there's nothing about, you know, what if the people who own private property accumulate and their wealth concentrates and they're massively exploiting everyone? Uh, liberalism has nothing to say about this. It's just like, ah, uh, we like freedom. Um, but really what I'm trying to say is it wasn't just a bunch of, of smart thinkers and wigs sitting in a room who are like, hmm, how do we come up with a system that gives people freedom, right? It was a system that emerged materially. It was a system that emerged out of, out of prior systems and, and emerged when a new class of people took power. And that class of people put in a, a political system that would be beneficial to them and that would serve their own interests. That's what liberalism was, not just, you know, um, a bunch of really smart people thinking about how to maximize freedom. And they knew full well this would lead to all kinds of struggles and failures and dangers and all that. They said, overall, this is the best system. And over time, society will become more peaceful and more progressive. I think the main problem people have with liberalism is this idea that it's too passive of a take on progressiveness and that it doesn't actively try to encourage its citizens to improve the conditions of the least well off. And instead, it instills this everyone for themselves kind of attitude. And within that, some people become wildly successful, while others struggle and kind of fall through the cracks. So you could say that liberalism is great for laying down a base layer of human rights, but it also tends to create large power imbalances within society and doesn't actively encourage its citizens to do much about it, at least in any kind of expedient way. So because of that, there's room for other ideologies that address that. And that's where Marxism comes in. Marxist Marxism just extends. I mean, this is a simplification too. I mean, it does look at the political rights of liberalism and say capitalism will make it so you can't live up to these. You won't have freedom of speech. The capitalists will control speech. You know, you won't have a democracy. The capitalists are going to control the elections. Um, so they, they say that liberalism can never live up to its own ideals. Um, but it's this is a very idealist explanation of the differences between liberalism and Marxism, right? Marxism says that liberalism kind of creates inequality in a sort of individualistic mindset. Like, no, 
you know, liberalism misses the fact that if you protect people's right to private property, if the state just works as a dictatorial force um, uh, protecting the right to private property, because of how capitalism works and how capital accumulates and concentrates, you know, you're going to have a massively unequal society, um, an imperialist society, a society with max exploitation, a society with constant economic crises, a society with homeless people, a society with a commodification of everything, including sex and drugs leading to sex and drug trades. Um, you know, these are the things that liberalism has nothing to say about, right? Because when it comes to economics, liberalism shrugs and says, well, we got to respect the contract between employer and employee, and we got to respect the, the right to private property. And, and there is, you know, where all the, the terrible things that we see resulting from capitalism in, after years of development, that's what they result from, um, a political system which only cares about protecting private property. Um, so, you know, it's not like Marxists are just like, oh, this kind of creates an individualist society. Why don't we have the government take everyone's private property away? It's no, you know, private property and, and the protection of private property and the employee-employee contract by the state is the basis of liberalism, which creates the basis of all the, the crappy things we see in class society today, um, as does the American Constitution, um, which is another liberal document. Um, thank you for the super chat for fact. I got to go keep fighting the good fight. Everyone. I will absolutely watch this when it's up on the channel. Thank you so much. Um, appreciate you for the support. Um, 10 bucks. That's a big donation. So thank you very much. Um, again, can't believe y'all support us financially. Uh, I, I guess I can believe it cause I've seen it, um, so much. And I guess I know how much work actually goes into what we do. Um, but just really, really, really appreciate that. Um, yeah, yeah. That's all I got to say. Really appreciate it. It's basically say that liberalism is a protection mechanism for oppressive behavior. And the alternative that they put forward goes something like them saying, freedom ends where oppression begins. How do they know where oppression begins? Because they're pretty much obsessed with it. Marxists are basically bloodhounds for oppression. The freedom that Karl Marx was concerned with was the freedom to own private property. And the oppression that Karl Marx was concerned with was class oppression. So I should talk about oppression for a minute because the way that Marxists frame oppression is very distinct. We normally think of oppression as something that arises or doesn't. So I've said in the past that Marx doesn't talk that much about oppression. He talks more about exploitation, which I don't fully agree with that statement anymore because there are a lot of places where Lenin, Stalin, Marx, whoever else, Engels talk about oppression which stems from exploitation, right? The, the point is that I, I need to make is that exploitation is the core, right? Exploitation is the originator. It's the engine that leads to accumulation and imperialism and oppression and, and the oppression of minority groups, the, the oppression of um, the class of workers, um, the oppression of foreign nations. You know, all of these stem from accumulation, which is, you know, built into the capital, or uh, it, it, it all stems from exploitation, right? So you have uh, a worker works all day, uh, the capitalist takes what he creates and sells it in a market and then gives the worker a little piece um, of what he created uh, via the wage. And then the capitalist takes the surplus, takes the profit and uses it to expand his operations, continue with reproduction, and then takes them home as, as profit. That leads to accumulation, that leads to concentration, that leads to imperialism. So you, it's not oppression, you know, that leads to all of these, these negative things. It's exploitation, which is an economic category. It's, an, you know, it's something that we can analyze economically. We could put a mathematical number on, on exploitation, especially, you know, because of the way that Marx lays it out. Um, he, he does a very scientific and, and mathematical explanation of what exploitation actually is and how it leads to accumulation and these other things. You know, so, so Marxists aren't obsessed with oppression. We analyze oppression. We side with oppressed groups. Um, but we understand that the basis of oppression you know, what's rotten at the core of the capitalist system um, is the the uh, employee employer relation and exploitation of the working masses, not just oppression. Circumstantially, and it's something that everyone should theoretically be capable of. So in one moment, you could hypothetically be an oppressor or not. And in another moment, I could be an oppressor or maybe even oppressed. And that should scale up too. like the Catholic Church. In one moment, you could say that they're an oppressor. And in another moment, you could say that they're not, or maybe they're even oppressed. 
So we normally think of it as something that no one is inherently guilty of, and also no one is inherently exempt from, and it's really dictated by a circumstance. Marxism, on the other hand, and this should already be sounding eerily familiar, has this particular way of dividing society up into two parts, the oppressed and the oppressors. And you're either in one group or the other. And what determines which group you fall into is based on your identity. No. Marxism doesn't do this because it gives, you know, analyses of different classes. It talks about the petty bourgeois class, the lumpen proletariat, the semi-proletariat, the peasantry. You know, it just says that the proletariat is the revolutionary class um, under in capitalist society, right? But it recognizes that there are other classes and that there are other classes even within capitalism. And the analysis of this is basically, you know, uh, like we can side or, or ally with the petty bourgeoisie, lump and proletariat, peasant class, whatever else, to the extent that they're willing to be allied with us, right? If you have a small business owner who's willing to fund revolutionary struggle and, and do education and work alongside the masses, why would you not ally with that person? You know, you're not going to dismiss that person just because they're technically petty bourgeois, right? It, it all depends on where they fall in the struggle, you know, and post-revolution, obviously, we don't want them to keep like brutally exploiting people and trying to accumulate, you know, they got to be down for the the revolutionary struggle through and through. Um, but Mao, you know, talks about the the importance of allying with the petty bourgeoisie during the revolutionary period, um, because there are many sectors of the petty bourgeoisie who will will side with the socialists. And then there are many who will just kind of side with whoever it looks like is going to win. You know, uh, during revolutionary periods, the petty bourgeois oftentimes will be like, oh, you know, I'm with the capitalists. And then the capitalists will start to lose. And they're like, oh, OK, we're with you guys. Um, <laughs> they kind of switch it around. Um, but. So, you know, it's it's far from dividing class or society into oppressors and oppressed. Um, but, you know, on some level, there is a division, you know, of those who are down for the revolutionary struggle and those who are not um, based on, you know, where they side politically and, and um, ideologically. Um, however, you know, there's there, it's more complicated than that. Like Mao says, you know, we can ally with some groups on some things, but then not ally with them on other things where we disagree, you know? So again, it's not just as simple as dividing society into oppressors and oppressed and then saying, fight it out. And in Marx's case, it was based in class identity. And he thought that the dynamics of this oppression were baked into the nature of society itself. True. So the only way to overcome this oppression is to change society itself. In other words, have a revolution and make a new society free from oppression. So then you might ask, Pretty how do you true. know what kind of fundamental change society needs in order to get rid of this oppression? And they would say, you need to figure out what was being allowed to occur in order for this oppression to take place. And in Marx's case, the freedom, again, that he was concerned with was the freedom to own private property. So the people who are exercising this freedom to own private property, and this includes the means of production, are necessarily the oppressors. And the people who are not exercising that freedom, so they don't own private property, are necessarily the oppressed. And as long as the freedom to own private property exists, oppression will inherently be baked into society. And he's saying exercising the freedom to own private property, you know, which is a liberal way to look at it. But it makes sense because he's, you know, talking about the difference between Marxism versus liberalism and liberalism claims to support freedom. You know, and Marx is saying you can't have a system that supports freedom so long as you protect private property because it's going to lead to accumulation, imperialism, blah, blah, blah. Marx thought that in order for this revolution to happen, people first need to awaken and see the nature of the oppression happening around them. And if they didn't, if they were blind to that oppression, in his terminology, they would then have false consciousness. If they awakened and they were able to see the true nature of this class oppression happening around them, in his terminology, they would gain class consciousness. Marx thought that a critical number of people needed to awaken to class consciousness. And if they did that, they would be naturally motivated to band together in a collective of like-minded class conscious people rise up and overthrow their oppressors and make a new utopian society. And by the way, the economic... Stop. Stop calling Marxism a utopia, please. Just stop. We need to construct a new society free of exploitation and class exploitation and imperialism. That doesn't mean a utopia. You can still stub your toe under communism and it'll still hurt. It, it's not going to be heaven, I'm sorry economic implementation of Marxism, where the freedom to own private property, especially if it relates to the means of production, is abolished, is communism. And the economic implementation of liberalism, where you have the right to own private property, 
and you have the freedom to exchange goods and services with others is capitalism. Well, that's not true. Because communism is supposed to be worker ownership of the means of production. Well, I guess private property specifically, you know, but it's not communism isn't abolishing the freedom to own private property and therefore the freedom to own the means of production. You know, communism is taking the means of production out of the hands of the few oligarchs who currently control it, you know, and using it to benefit the masses, giving it to the masses, allowing the masses to control and decide what's produced. Um, and distribute what's produced in a way that's rational, not just that's rational, but that allows society to develop, that allows people to develop intellectually, that allows people to be able to support themselves without having to work um, starvation wages or, you know, toil for hours and hours a day doing hard labor, um, which is, you know, why China is now surpassing the U.S. as the most powerful um, economy on the planet and why their retirement age has been sinking every year. It's now 55 for women, 60 for men. Um, why the U.N. has recognized China's poverty alleviation programs as the most incredible poverty alleviation programs in human history. Um, it is because of uh, uh, because not only uh, does socialism give workers more control in production and, you know, help the workers or, or design production and distribution in a way that that benefits the workers, but it increases the productive forces. Right. It's uh, socialism is all about construction, um, constructing a, a new society which supports the new ruling class, the working masses. Um, so it, it takes the means of production and advances them and, and you know, to their their utmost technological capabilities um, and and, you know, disperses the means of production so that it's owned by the mass of society. So, yeah, Marxism 101. Marxism is an inherently unstable ideology that tends to initially sound good, but then gets out of control. So if a Marxist says freedom ends where oppression begins. That sounds just like liberalism. <laughs> liberalism sounds really good. They say they're going to protect your freedom and then it gets out of control. And then we protect the freedom to own private property. And then the people who own private property accumulate billions and billions of dollars. And then 80% of the country lives paycheck to paycheck. And the military budget is $700 trillion because you're uh, killing people and bombing people all around the world uh, to protect and expand the wealth of those people who own private property. And it all starts, you know, from, oh, just let us own private property, man. It's going to be good. We're going to protect your freedom. Just trust us, man. Um, yeah. You might say, hey, I mean, that doesn't sound bad. We don't want to be born into a world where people oppress us for things we can't control. But then you say, wait, where is this oppression? And they say, everywhere. And then you say, well, who gets to say what is and isn't oppression? And they say, we do. And you say, can we talk about it? And they say, no. If you disagree with them, Marxist organizations tend to categorize you as part of the problem. So this is why the exploitation versus oppression distinction is important. As this person says here, we can infer ethical conclusions, but Marx was not a moralist, right? A, a Marxist analysis is not about the oppression Olympics. So it's not what Ryan Chapman just said it is, right? It's not, you know, these groups are the oppressed and these groups are the oppressors. And, and we decide who's oppressed and who are the oppressors based on whatever is convenient. Right. The goal of Marxism is, is getting rid of exploitation and alienation and, you know, the wage labor or wage slavery relation while also increasing the productive forces. But um, exploitation, as we were saying, is something that can be measured. It's something that can be measured mathematically. Right. There's a certain amount of surplus value that a capitalist takes versus a certain amount that's given to the worker and wages and a certain amount that's produced, a certain amount that's sold on the market um, and transformed into money. Um and, you know, these things lead to accumulation and oppression, like we said. Um, but the goal is abolishing exploitation, this this very this measurable material thing at the core of society. You're exploited every day when you go to work. Um, you get a certain amount of money in wages and your your boss gets a, a large percent of that money um, in, in his surplus value. Um, so, you know, the the class struggle then is determined by exploitation. Right. The class struggle is determined by who is the toiling class and who is the exploiting class. You know, and, and as we were saying before, uh, if people in, in other classes choose to side with the toiling class, that's great. You know, then they can fight on the side of the toiling class in the class struggle. But the, the lines are drawn in the class struggle based on who's exploiting and who's not. 
You know, it's not based on my arbitrary uh, idealist conception of who are the oppressors and who's not the oppressors, right? You can't measure oppression mathematically. You can't measure who the oppressed class is. You can look at, you know, um, how minority groups are, are preyed upon by the police or, or exploited um, extra uh, and, and stuff like that and talk about these issues of oppression. Um, but ultimately, the class struggle stems from exploitation. There would still be a class struggle, even if those um, other forms of like racist oppression or whatever else didn't exist. You know, there would still be exploitation and, and the need for class struggle. Um, and, and, you know, this is like if you look at feudalism, the exploited class were the peasants. The exploiting class were the, the monarchs and, and the feudal lords and the church. Um, so that's what drew the lines in that class struggle. You had the emerging emerging capitalist class who didn't like the feudal uh, the feudal system or the feudal ruling class. And then you had the peasants who also didn't like the feudal ruling class. Um, so these lines were drawn uh, uh, based on class struggle based on or these these lines of class struggle. This battle between classes is drawn ba or the lines are drawn based on exploitation. So I'm tripping over my words. I'm probably going rambling too long. Um, here, I'll try and keep it short and sweet next time I come back. And when Marxist organizations come into power, they tend to shortly after declare speech and action against the movement as oppression, and they abolish political opposition, and things tend to quickly go further downhill from there. As you probably know, every attempt to implement Marxism so far upon a whole country has been a disaster for human rights, bringing tyranny, death, censorship, and shortages, and never bringing the free utopian society that was promised and we think was responsible for the deaths of something like 100 million people in the 20th century. And the people who suffer the worst are always working class people. The people- Come on, Ryan, you were doing well. Ish. But th then he cited the Black Book of Communism. The 100 million statistic, the people who came up with that statistic themselves said it's not true. So maybe do a Google search on that next time. People who Marxism was promising to represent. But that being said, Karl Marx was a pretty smart guy, and a lot of the critiques he made of liberalism and capitalism were pretty sharp. And if you read some of them today, you might even agree with them, even if he's obviously not capturing the full picture. I think because of that, there have, since Marx's death, always been people who were inspired by him and didn't think that the disasters of trying to implement Marxism were enough of a deterrent and decided to try to adapt Marx to their own political environment. So the practice of doing that, of taking Marx and adapting him, not taking him literally word for word, is called neo-Marxism. No, no. Taking Marxism and adapting it to your own conditions is called Marxism. That's what Marxism is. Marxism isn't based off a person. It isn't based off the doctrine of Karl Marx like he was some religious figure who wrote the Ten Commandments. Marxism is a science. Marxism is a lens of analysis. Marxism is a living, breathing, intellectual tradition of people who have attempted to apply to apply Marxist analysis to their own countries and organize class struggle in their own countries to construct and bring about a better society, not a utopia, but a better society that uh, maximizes human flourishing. Um, it, it is not, or, I mean, that is Marxism. Marx was very clear that he was analyzing Europe. You know, and towards the end of his life, as he got to look elsewhere, you know, he said my analysis or the the analysis that I did for Europe, you know, I, I kind of showed how to do it. I gave an example, but that needs to be applied everywhere. Right. We need to to look at class struggle and, you know, look at every single unique country through a historical materialist lens. And Lenin was very clear about this. Lenin was extremely clear, so clear, in fact, that he said, you know, Marx was looking at Europe during the Industrial Revolution. So he said that the, the revolution would be led by the proletariat, you know, the, the class of wage laborers, because that's what the class was in Germany, because they had more developed capitalism. But in Russia, we have a giant class of peasants. You know, Russia is a semi-feudal country. We don't have fully developed capitalism. So the proletariat, who Marx identified as the revolutionary class in Russia should ally with the peasants because the peasants are also the or also an exploited and therefore potentially revolutionary class. So you want to talk about applying Marxism, you know, to, to their own conditions. Um, that is Marxism Leninism. 
not neo-Marxism, not Adorno and Horkheimer and the Frankfurt School and all these CIA-backed French academics talking about how the Soviet Union and China are evil, big, bad dictatorships. Marxism-Leninism is taking Marxism and adapting it to every country's conditions and tweaking it to meet country's conditions. But neo-Marxists don't call themselves neo-Marxists. They tend to just call themselves plain Marxists. So I'm going to use that word too because it's shorter and there's about zero people trying to adapt Marx literally in the 21st century. And I don't know how to talk about neo-Marxists without feeling like I'm doing this. So I think wokeness is the result of a series of adaptations of Marx. And I think that there's a clear intellectual path we can follow to get us there. And I'm actually not aware of any alternatives. So if you have one, let me know because I'm genuinely curious. But in the meantime, I'm going to lay out the path of adaptations as I understand it. I'm it's just the U.S. State Department co-opting anti-racist struggle an LGBTQ struggle. You know, racism and sexism and bigotry uh, have been built into this country in the past. You know, the U.S. used, uh, the U.S. State Department and the ruling class used racism to justify their exploitation. You know, of course, you had slavery based on skin color in this country. And then after that, you know, you have the prison industrial complex, the, the racist war on drugs. Racism has been used to exploit but now that the ruling class, you know, sees that people don't like racism and people are mad about racism and people are mad about, you know, discrimination against LGBTQ people, they just, you know, slap a bunch of BLM flags on their stuff and wave a bunch of pride flags and try and pretend like they haven't been exploiting or, or oppressing minority groups for years. That's all it is, is, you know, because of mass struggle, you know, thankfully, uh, or, I mean, thankfully, there's been massive struggle against racism and sexism, and now corporations are trying to co-opt that, so we won't realize that they are the ones who are actually perpetrating um, racism and sexism and bigotry, uh, as well as the system of exploitation and the wage, uh, wage slavery relation at the core of capitalist society. I'm going to break it down into three major steps. The first was to expand Marx's ideas, which were at the time almost entirely about class, into the realm of culture. The first major influence for this came from this Italian man in the early 1900s who argued that elites control culture and that control they have over culture gives them a kind of dominating influence over the public and makes the public kind of complacent with whatever the agenda elites have for them. So in liberal capitalist society, the elites within that society can use culture to essentially brainwash the public into not questioning that society. And that's why these revolutions that Marx predicted haven't been happening. So to fix that, Marxists need to get influence in culture and once they, they gain that cultural influence, they can use it to educate the public. And once that happens, then the public will rise up and revolution will happen. I hate kind of how they always attach Gromsky to the Frankfurt School, assuming that's where he's moving. I, I'm sure that's where he's going now that he said neo-Marxists are the root of Idpol. I'm sure he's going to the French and Frankfurt School um, thinkers. And, you know, Gromsky was basically said, you know, the capitalists, once they accumulate and control more and more, they're just, they're also going to control the media apparatuses. Um, and they're going to control the education systems. And they're going to use it, you know, to, to perpetrate capitalist education, capitalist propaganda, capitalist brainwashing, which of course he was right about. And that's just an extension of Marx's analysis. Um, and then a lot of the Frankfurt School thinkers would draw on Gromsky, but Gromsky, I wish he wasn't associated with like these postmodernists or the so-called neo-Marxists, because I think Gromsky's analysis is awesome um, versus a lot of the neo-Marxists were CIA um, or, or CIA adjacent. Um, and Gromsky wrote his stuff from prison, not from the wealthy academies. So the incorporation of Gromsky, sorry, thank you for the pronunciation help. Of Marxism into culture is called cultural Marxism. And no, that's not a right-wing uh, anti-Semitic buzzword. That's an actual academic word that people have been using for a long time. And if you don't believe me, go into Google Scholar and type in cultural Marxism. Cultural Marxism was then expanded upon starting in the 20s and 30s by the work of a think tank called the Frankfurt School, which was a bunch of guys that basically set out to criticize and readapt Marx after they saw that Marxism had failed to overtake capitalism in Western civilization. And they expanded upon these ideas of... No, after socialism had risen in the East and taken over the capitalist or feudal or oppressive imperialist systems in the East and threatened the capitalist systems in the West, the CIA started supporting pseudo-Marxist academics, academics who called themselves Marxists while saying the Soviet Union, that's ridiculous. They don't understand Marxism. China, they don't understand Marxism. I don't care what they're doing. Only I understand Marxism here in this French uh, college. 
um, heavily funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and the CIA. Only I understand Marxism. Um, and this is real, true Marxism. And real, true Marxism doesn't care about revolution. You know, it's all about sitting in the academy and, you know, taking LSD and, um, yeah. <laughs> Cultural Marxism, saying that the elites who control culture in all these different ways are the oppressors. And regular people who are subject to the impositions of this culture are the oppressed. And the culture they're critiquing is the liberal culture. So they're saying that liberal culture is basically forcing people into these boxes of how it wants them to behave and how to think. So it's controlling their thoughts, it's controlling their behavior. And they say this all has a dehumanizing effect that makes them not be able to think outside the system and to be less alive. And if you shift people's focus entirely towards culture, um, like people are saying cultural Marxism is a right-wing dog whistle. Um, it probably is, but I mean, his... I'm sure it is at this point, but his explanation of what the Frankfurt School thinkers said isn't that wrong, right? Like this idea that they wanted to focus, you know, more on ideas, you know, more on cultural struggle. Because if you get people to focus on cultural struggle rather than class struggle, you take all their real power away. You take their material struggle away. Um, so they only struggle in the realm of ideas, which, of course, isn't isn't real struggle at all. Well, it can be right. We're struggling in the realm of ideas right now by spreading socialist education. Um, but that only matters if y'all go organize, right? If y'all actually do something materially to engage in material class struggle. So these pseudo Marxist, you know, pro CIA thinkers, um, we're getting everybody to stop thinking about class struggle and, and start thinking about um, ideological struggle only, cultural struggles, um, various sort of uh, identity struggles. Uh, so, you know, kind of what I'm sure he's going to describe here is wokeness you know, wokeness as opposed to uh, actual material class struggle. Um, yeah, and I, I don't think that's entirely wrong. Uh, uh, Gabriel Rockhill points out that um, pretty much all of the, the neo-Marxist or Frankfurt School academics in France, whenever there was a real uprising, whenever there was a workers uprising, um, when the workers did something materially in terms of struggling against their exploiters, uh, the Frankfurt School dismissed it. Right. They dismissed it as as uh, violent and bad. And, you know, we just need to sit in the academy and write more books, you know, stop engaging in all that darn class struggle. And of course, you know, two of the famous ones, Adorno and Horkheimer, supported the freaking Vietnam War. They supported the U.S. in the Vietnam War because Ho Chi Minh and the Vietnamese and the Viet Minh were violent. And apparently it's not violent to drop Agent Orange and Napalm on on civilians and peasant farmers. But I think the main contribution of the Frankfurt School was to take these types of critiques and place them in a modern, um, updated American framework, because they're mostly working out of New York at the time and mostly critiquing American culture. So that gave people on the left in America access to these kinds of critiques. And on top of that, they wove in these radicalizing arguments for the left, like this book, which tried to redefine authoritarianism as something that not anyone can be capable of, but something that only the... How can you argue that this is a Marxist book? I mean, I understand Ryan Chapman, right? He doesn't really understand what Marxism is. But how do Marxists today argue that the authoritarian personality is a Marxist book? This is one, like, both side-ism, which is the number one thing propagated by the CIA and the U.S. State Department and the in bourgeois propaganda since World War II. You know, this idea that Hitler and Stalin were the same um, because they both had the authoritarian personality. They were both totalitarian. Um, forget the fact that their governments and their economies were totally different and came about in a totally different way. And that the communists uh, fought the fascists and the Soviets inflicted 80 percent of German casualties. Forget that Hitler and Stalin were the same. Both had the authoritarian personality. And this is so individualistic. This is so individualistic. Some people have the authoritarian personality and some people have the submissive personality. No, this is not Marxism. Marxism is class analysis. You know, the only time Marxism goes into the individuals when he, he's talking about the individual workers, individual relation with the capitalist. So then he can expand it to a class analysis and say it's in the interests of everyone in this class to overthrow the ruling class. What the heck are you talking about with this, you know, analyzing everybody's individual personality and you know we can't uh, some people are just you know more lenient towards authoritarianism naturally they're just born with it what are you talking about that's not materialist you know that's not the idea that our environment and you know the the structure of society is what shapes our psychology and our interests this is totally anti-marxist even though the idea of this the very idea of this book 
which this is one of the most famous books that the CIA just freaking loved uh, that came out of the Frankfurt School. Right is capable of. This was another hugely influential piece, which argued that tolerance in the traditional sense of being tolerant of people you disagree with actually serves to protect oppression happening in society. And as an alternative, he proposes liberating tolerance. And what is that? It's to be intolerant of people on the right and extra tolerant of people on the left. So he's advocating against free speech for people on the right. And he's saying to enforce this, people can go outside the law if they need to, and even use violence if they need to, since he questions the effectiveness of nonviolence. The people who read this and believe that this is Marxism have never read Marx or any of the serious Marxist revolutionaries who actually brought Marxism into practice. Mao was huge, huge on reaching everybody. You know, he said that when we capture prisoners of war, even when they were fighting a civil war against the right wing imperialist backed nationalists, they would let the prisoners of war go instead of torturing them. They would treat them with respect. And Mao said over and over again, you know, even the most reactionary members of the masses, uh, you shouldn't shame them and throw crap at them or mock them for their ignorance. That'll just push them, you know, more into reaction. You need to encourage them to go forward, encourage them to progress in their politics, you know, to, to educate themselves and become a socialist or communist, engage in the struggle. And then you have Adorno who's like, nope, you know, if you think somebody's right wing, if they have conservative social values, you need to fight them. You need to physically fight them, just like grab a trash can and smash them over the head with it. Go totally WWE on the ass. Um, and then eventually that's how we'll bring about socialism and fight racism. Like this is just taking Marxism and taking the idea of class struggle and making it individualistic and idealistic rather than collective and materialistic. Speculating that Gandhi's success with it may have been a fluke. So this was basically the early intellectual version of the Antifa handbook, and also just a broad intellectual justification for the censorship of the right by people on the left while labeling it progressive. I know it's hard to imagine that these types of academic works can really have that much of an influence on reality, but you have to realize this guy was very popular at the time, especially on college campuses. He had a kind of superstar intellectual kind of status. Similar and that is largely what the CIA and the U.S. State Department facilitated, creating these superstar academics. So even if the academics weren't directly taking orders from the CIA, they knew, you know, if they wanted to keep this superstar status, if they wanted to keep making a bunch of money as an intellectual doing speaking engagements on college campuses, facilitated by the State Department and the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation and the CIA, they had to keep, you know, talking about how evil China and the Soviet Union are and talking about how Marxism um, has always failed, even though I'm totally a Marxist, bro. More to how we think of like Zizek or Peterson or maybe Bell Hooks today. So this wasn't like some kind of obscure work that nobody read. But anyway, I'm just gonna do one more because I'm trying not to make the section boring and I'm not totally confident that I'm succeeding at it. This paper brought together the ideas of the Frankfurt School under the name critical theory. Critical theory compares itself to traditional theory, which is when people try to be objective in their examination of and interpretation of the world. Critical theorists, on the other hand, have their political goals in mind as they work through academia. So they don't say what they think is objectively true. They say, if they're a critical theorist, what they need to say in order to reach their political goals. So this is planting the seeds for the death of objectivity in leftist academia and giving intellectual justification for people to work in academia as political agents. So what are the goals they said academics should be aiming for? To adapt Marx and transform us into the right kind of society. What kind of society is that? A society where there is no exploitation or oppression. A society where injustice is abolished. The second major stage started in the 60s when this cultural Marxist framework was adapted by anti-politics movements. At the time, there was a huge resurgence of interest in Marx, especially among young people. And the activism that came out of that is broadly referred to as the New Left. And the leader of the New Left is mostly thought to be Marcuse, who wrote Repressive Tolerance, who I was just talking about. So he was working at the same time that this stage was starting. So the timelines are a little bit blurred. And Marcuse has written a book like that uh, Carlos has uh, criticized and talked about how there are good things in it, but mostly ripped it apart called One Dimensional Man basically arguing that there's no class division anymore, that the classes are culturally the same and, you know, that therefore there's no class struggle. The classes have merged. Notice how everything that came out of the Frankfurt School and the new left and um, what this guy's saying eventually led to wokeism, all of that, um, it distracts from class struggle. You know, it's we need to focus on critical theory and we need to struggle, you know, in, in the intellectual field by, by applying uh, or by, yeah, by... Uh, 
attacking things that are right wing and being left wing um, when it comes to academia. Um, and then uh, Marcuse, oh, there's only there's only, you know, one it's one dimensional man. There's no class struggle between two divided classes, you know, which is a struggle created by exploitation. Uh, the working masses invest into the stock market now. You know, they have tiny 401k plans. So they're basically capitalists. Forget about class struggle. Um, it's it's anything to distract people from actually organizing their workplace and fighting for better conditions. Yeah, there. Anyway, this is the time period where critical race theory was developed, which took critical theory and integrated it into a racial framework. Critical race theory presumes that unfavorable differences in group outcomes come from racial oppression. And as a solution wants to end racial oppression, among a broader goal of wanting to end all forms of oppression, which also puts us in a world where the First Amendment is attacked on the grounds of being a protection mechanism for racial oppression. Around the same time, second wave feminism showed up as an alternative to the more liberal first wave that came before it. And the basic Marxist contribution to that was to take Marx's idea of the proletariat breaking free of their chains and seizing the means of production from the bourgeoisie, taking that and replacing it with women breaking free of the shackles that men had put on them and empowering each other to rise up and smash the patriarchy. That's a not a Marxist contribution. You know, that's liberal feminism co-opting Marxism and you know, taking Marxism and saying, you know, forget about that class struggle. It's all about a struggle between genders. But Marx and Engels were like the OG feminists, especially for their time um, when it comes to old white men in Europe, I guess. Um, Engels said that, you know, you can judge the advancement of any society based on the role of women in that society, the place of women in that society, um, because capitalism degrades women and it forces them into um, sex work to survive um, and, and exploits them and, and is dependent on their domestic labor and, and ties them to the home and monogamous relationships, which oftentimes um, can become abusive. And then women have trouble leaving those relationships if they're financially tied to the men. Uh, capitalism is extremely exploitative to women. So therefore, you know, real women's liberation, real women's emancipation uh, comes from class struggle, from the struggle of working class men and working class women against the capitalist class. So we can construct a society that that does give women, you know, um, their proper place and, and does allow women to develop themselves and does give women all the, the political um, rights and economic opportunities that men have. Um, but you're not going to have that unless you have class struggle, right? You can't have that just between struggle between genders. That is liberalism. Um, and, you know, that's much of what the Western Academy did at this time was, uh, um, you know, argue against Marxist feminism and in favor of liberal feminism. We just need gender struggle against the patriarchy, not a class struggle against the ruling class and the patriarchy because the ruling class are the ones who uphold and, and create the patriarchy. The Gay Liberation Front happened around the same time. And I think for a lot of people, it was just an opportunity to get respect and visibility for people who weren't straight. But if you look at the literature, like the manifestos that came out of it, it did have an explicitly Marxist society. Necessarily means white people are the oppressors and non-white people are the oppressed. In feminism, it became the power dynamics in patriarchal society necessarily means men are the oppressors and women are the oppressed. Replacing class with gender and race and sexuality. And in queer theory, it became the power dynamics in heteronormative society necessarily. So I, I honestly think we get the, the gist of it now. It's pretty much what I thought it was. Um, but yeah, he, he tr it's interesting because he's not a Marxist. So he tries to trace the intellectual roots of Marxism to wokeism or to, you know, replacing the idea of class struggle with exclusively gender struggle or exclusively racial struggle, you know, taking class struggle out of it. And he says, because the neo-Marxists in France and the Frankfurt School propped up these ideas and created these ideas, therefore, you know, they, they can be traced directly back to Karl Marx. Missing the fact that, you know, Marxism is alive and well in China and the East and uh, the global South, um, but those Marxists don't dismiss existing socialism, right? They learn from China and Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union, and they consider these to be socialist countries, uh, but we need to learn from their failures and, you know, adapt Marxism to our current conditions um, over 200 years after Marx died because um, conditions have changed. Uh, but in the U.S., you know, we have this sort of ridiculous uh, pseudo idea of Marxism that's been propped up in the academy by the U.S. State Department, by the ruling capitalist class, 
um, by the U.S. intelligence agencies like the CIA. Um, and it masquerades as being Marxism, right? It pretends to be Marxism when in reality it's just liberalism. It says we care about gender struggle and racial struggle and class struggle. But in reality, Marxism has always cared about struggle or the struggles of oppressed groups, the uh, racial and gender struggles. It just recognizes that class struggle is necessary to actually bring about change, you know, and actually bring about um, successful struggle when it comes to to other forms, to uh, gender struggle and, and uh, anti-racist struggle. And what the the pseudo Marxist Frankfurt School thinkers do is conceal that. You know, they say, nope, it's it's just you just got to focus on racial and gender struggle. Otherwise, you'll end up like the evil Soviet Union and evil China. Forget the fact that the Soviet Union and China massively increased life expectancy for the working masses, taught their entire populations to read, expanded health care to millions who didn't have it, ended famines. You know, forget that Marxism's always failed. Just focus on this cultural stuff. You know, just be woke. Um, so yeah, it's interesting that Ryan Chapman looked at that and thought it could be directly traced to Marx. Um, and it shows how, how it shows the purpose of what Gabriel Rockhill calls the global theory industry, um, in producing this kind of pseudo Marxist theory. Um, and it shows how, how good of a job they've done to where someone who's not a Marxist, like Ryan Chapman can take a look at this, um, and think that wokeism stems from Marxism. And, and I think it's a similar phenomenon with Jordan Peterson. Right. I think Jordan Peterson looked at the pseudo Marxist Frankfurt School thinkers and then he was like, oh, this is what Marxism is. It's just liberalism now or, or extreme liberalism, wokeism or whatever.